A warm welcome and also a happy new year 2022 to all attendees. My name is Valentin Rudloff and I'm part of the UN Climate Technology Center network and will be hosting today's webinar. One administrative note just before we start, um, this webinar is recorded and will be published on the CTCN website, but no information on yourself as an attendee will be disclosed um, when recording. This webinar is uh, number four on supporting mitigation finance through blockchain and is part of a larger webinar series of six webinars on the topic of blockchain technology for climate policy implementation. The webinar series is uh, running until the end of January and touches on topics such as blockchain 101, energy markets, mitigation and adaptation finance, carbon markets and value chains. On the CTCN website, you can also watch the recordings of all the previous webinars if you have missed uh, any of these. The webinars are delivered by the UN Climate Technology Center Network in collaboration with our network member, the Blockchain and Climate Institute. Uh, first of all, a few words on the CTCN. Uh, the CTCN is the implementation arm of the UNFCCC technology mechanism. The center promotes the accelerated transfer of environmentally sound technologies for low carbon climate resilient development at the request of developing countries. And we as the CTCN provide technology solutions, capacity building advice on policy, legal and regulatory frameworks tailored to the specific needs of individual countries by harnessing the expertise of a global network of about 650 technology companies and institutions. On the other side, the Blockchain and Climate Institute, short BCI, is a volunteer-led not-for-profit organization founded at COP23 in 2017, combining the functions of a think-and-do tank and an advocacy group supporting governments and businesses in the deployment of blockchain and other emerging technologies in climate change policy implementation. A few words, a few words on its mission. Um, their mission is to affect positive changes by raising awareness among the international climate change policy community of the tremendous potential of uh, blockchain technology to considerably enhance and accelerate climate actions. So as already introduced um, quickly, today's webinar will provide an overview on blockchain in the context of mitigation finance, including concepts of result-based payment and asset tokenization, Questions that we will answer are how can blockchain enhance mitigation finance? How could international finance mechanisms integrate blockchain technology? And also how can we uh, draw more financing in infrastructure projects for climate mitigation, for example? We will have about 20 minutes of introduction to the topic, followed by two 10 minute use case presentations, and we will close with a 10 minutes Q&A session. Please do not hesitate to already send your questions through the Q&A function during the webinar. Uh, since we have three presentations, you might uh, as well send them already during the webinar. Um, simply do so by clicking on the three dots at the very bottom, very right. Um, there you can see the Q&A function and uh, we will definitely pick them, them up at the end of the, the session today. I also want to take uh, this opportunity oops i i'm sorry i forgot to change some some information here sorry to bill and uh, and alex but i will i will orally um correct this um i first start with pedro bice uh, who is the data specialist in artificial intelligence internet of things and dlt to support the 17 sustainable development goals he's interested in developing state-of-the-art products and services that are driven by data uh, and cut across individual disciplines in order to deliver capabilities not currently available anywhere, particularly in supporting of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Dr. Bais is serving the research division at the moment of uh, the Blockchain Climate Institute. Bill Cantrop, not a founder and chairman of CEO of Arbel Market, but um, the uh, co-founder uh, of All Infra has been involved in Asia's environmental and infrastructure market since 2001 across uh, noble environmental uh, solutions and carbon credits and as head of Asia environmental financial products and head of Asia renewable renewables at Macquarie Bank and Macquarie Capital. Bill has cultivated a broad and trusted network of sustainability leaders uh, in the capital markets, private sector and government and more recently Bill has partnered with leaders in the blockchain 
blockchain space and focus on applying blockchain technology to the financing of infrastructure and environmental assets through the establishment of all infra. We will hear more about all infra later. And as well, uh, Alex Casas, uh, not the correct title, but I will correct this orally now. Um, Alex Casas is the social entrepreneur, uh, is a social entrepreneur passionate about blockchain potential to build a more fair and sustainable world. Uh, he has previously founded several companies and initiatives, uh, including Shelpin, Blockchain for Humanity Foundation, and the Leon Blockchain Hub. And since 2016, he has been involved in projects such as RSK, Debnode, Eternity, and is currently working as the head of blockchain in Climate Trade and as advisor in Ethic Hub. Before crypto, he was the co-founder and manager of an outsourcing company with 3,000 employees in three continents. So without further uh, introducing, this is enough from my side and it uh, is my great pleasure to hand over now to Dr. Pedro Weiss to introduce the topic of today. Thank you very much, Constantine. Uh, uh, welcome everybody to, to this session. Um, I will start sharing my presentation. Hopefully you can see something very soon. Um, if you could confirm yep. that you can see it. We can see it. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Pedro. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, again, welcome to this uh, uh, CTCN BCI uh, uh, webinar. Uh, as uh, as described, uh, you know, an introduction, I will be providing just a very uh, short introduction into this uh, broad, uh, huge topic uh, and growing topic of uh, uh, mitigation finance. Uh, particularly when combined with technologies such as, for example, blockchain. But I will expand that, you know, there are many technologies that could be leveraged to facilitate and scale this much needed uh, action. Uh, I won't go through the introduction. I think, you know, that you, you heard a bit about me. I think uh, some other relevant information that was mentioned there is that the fact that uh, I'm involved in uh, a standardization of, of the big field of sustainable finance, uh, for example, represent the United Kingdom in uh, so, 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 some committees, such as, for example, the Chairman and Advisory Group for ISO TC322, which is focused on sustainable finance. And I also recently became the convener of a, a specific uh, working group in ISO focused on fintech uh, uh, for sustainable finance. Uh, to help, I will provide this uh, video that hopefully will uh, explain. Climate things. finance is one of the major strategies to address climate change because large scale investments are required in sectors that emit large quantities of greenhouse gases. The Paris Agreement underscores the importance of increasing the flow of capital and supporting actions for a transparent framework of climate actions as the world aims to mobilize at least $100 billion a year. But the global climate finance flow has not met this target partly due to insufficient communication and regulations, inadequate capacity as well as high cost of transactions. In terms of mitigation finance, for example, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, or RED plus in short, is a mechanism developed by the United Nations to encourage afforestation and forest conservation in developing countries by offering results-based payments for results-based actions. Blockchain paired with Red Plus projects can help tackle some of the challenges these projects are facing, such as double counting, land rights, accurate monitoring and verification, leakage, or benefit sharing. Besides, private sector capital mobilization has also been slower than it should be, owing to the complexity and high cost of developing green finance product offerings, such as green bonds. Blockchain can ease some of these challenges by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer transactions on a shared network where algorithms perform the functions of verification without the need for a centralized authority to conduct paper-based verification. The asset-backed tokens on the blockchain can increase resource efficiency and traceability of these green investment outcomes. All in all, this is technological layer that can support financial marketplaces in being more transparent, speeding up projects, granting investors or fund recipients a much higher degree of credibility and security, ultimately ensuring greater public confidence and a higher degree of mobilization of climate finance flows. Okay. 
uh, hopefully that uh, was a very good summary uh, video that provided an intro into the rest of the presentation. So, uh, as you know, this uh, session is about really the, the basics. And I, I think first we need to start introducing, you know, what is green or sustainable finance? Uh, this is, as I mentioned before, this is uh, uh, strongly linked to some, the work I'm, work I'm doing with ISO. And this specific diagram that you see here is coming from the uh, UN. And it was actually adopted in ISO and it's heavily used across the industry. Uh, to try to define all the different flavors of sustainability or, or, or the different aspects of it. So when we talk about sustainable finance, obviously it's, it's the biggest uh, and broadest concept, uh, which is what you can see here is similar to when we talk about sustainable development and the 17 SDGs. So that will involve then environmental, social uh, governance aspects. Now, when we talk about green or climate or environmental finance, then we are actually working on a subset. Uh, for example, the environmental aspects, you know, you can talk about a uh, specific low carbon, climate or green uh, type finance. Uh, so this is a, a, a bit of an overview of that. Uh, it's good to mention that a lot of these definitions are changing uh, and are adjusting. Uh, uh, in fact, some of the work that or some of the complexities that this field has for practitioners is the fact that it's a, it is very crowded. For example, if we talk only about equities, there are plenty competing standards to try to define what is actually uh, ESG aligned. And that is uh, uh, currently some of the ongoing work with these standardization efforts. For example, IFRS took on the, the, the battle recently at COP. Uh, 26 to actually try to bring homogenization between all these different definitions. Happy to go in detail there if there are some specific questions, but let's go into the actual uh, aspects of mitigation finance. Uh, some key aspects is, uh, that are worth highlighting and sometimes not everybody's aware is that most climate finance is mobilized deployed locally. Uh, and also that in fact, when it comes to mitigation, uh, uh, most climate finance actually is coming from private entities and households and corporations, not from governments. Uh, most climate projects are financed and implemented by the same organization. And technological advances have led to innovations in many sectors, especially energy, agriculture, forestry, waste and transport. We'll have other speakers, for example, talking a bit about some of these examples. And currently, Mitigation focused finance represents over 70% of the public finance reports in developed countries. Uh, this report uh, uh, was for coming from the Climate Policy Initiative, which has been trying to track this flow of finance. You know, this is where we try to get these figures of how much actual finance is, is uh, being directed to specific projects. Some key facts from this recent report um, that go back, you know, 2018 19 is that we have about 253 billions. Uh, uh, that went into, uh, uh, that was kind of the average annual public finance uh, uh, per year, and it represents about 44% of total commitments. Uh, private finance, on the other hand, from that, you know, represents about 56%, showing the important uh, aspects that uh, private investors have on this uh, growing area. Uh, mitigation finance accounts for 93% of the flows in, in these past years. Obviously, this continues to change, uh, but it's good to highlight that at the moment, you know, uh, uh, for example, investments in energy, uh, transportation, they have accounted for a majority of some of this, and it goes obviously for mitigation. Review and energy remains the primary destination sector. And East and Asia and Pacific remain uh, one of the largest uh, regional providers for the destination of this climate finance. You, we can see here a bit on the F, you know, that, that growth. Uh, um, there are a specific uh, uh, estimates, you know, how much actual climate finance do we need really to meet the commitments? And there are different reports. Uh, we would like to highlight this one from the OECD. Uh, that came actually relatively recently. And they estimate that we need about $6.9 trillion a year uh, up to 2030 to really avoid the you know, climate catastrophe. 
Uh, we are way behind this target. Um, you, you saw from the previous slides that we are in the order of just 500 uh, million, uh, five to 700. Uh, but we need to increase to about 7 trillion a year. Uh, uh, from this, well, you can see here a, 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 a breakdown of, for example, what the type of uh, 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 investments, you know, infrastructure, which we will have, for example, later, uh, you know, for example, uh, Bill uh, talking probably a bit more about these areas. He's been working on, on it. Uh, and green bond markets as well, that it's an area where we also at BCI have been extensively working, is one of those areas that have ex uh, exploded in recent years. But unfortunately, it, it is not enough. Uh, as you can see, we, we have seen what is the current state, what we need, and, and comparing, we are just about 10% of what we need. So we still have 90% to go. Uh, to meet the actual uh, deadlines that have been established by scientists, uh, especially on, on, on the run-up to 2030. Uh, uh, in this regard, then we wonder, well, what are the problems? You know, where are the barriers to actually uh, really scale uh, sustainable finance to the levels that it actually needs to be? Uh, there are many reasons, and obviously it's, it's hard sometimes. It depends as well on the specific type of financial instrument, you know, for example, equities versus fixed income. Uh, it depends also as well on regions. Uh, and also it depends a lot as well strongly on the specific type of economic sector, you know, uh, energy versus transportation versus agriculture. But we can uh, identify a few common barriers to adoptions. Number one is the lack of communication between financial institutions and local governments. Uh, uh, number two is this uncertainty over regulation and tax policies. And number three is this inadequate capacity and expertise, uh, which uh, we have to say, you know, it, it is not necessarily we need to blame practitioners because uh, we even those that are uh, very focused on this changing world of sustainable finance is very hard to keep pace. So uh, this means that, uh, for example, ongoing activities like this one that CTCN is promoting are essential to keep growing that capacity and expertise across uh, all the world and not just in a specific area, uh, jurisdictions like, for example, London. And we need to keep growing communications among uh, all the different stakeholders. Uh, this involves not just obviously the financial sector and, and, and governments, but also uh, project developers. For example, the, those developers that can deliver uh, 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 wind or solar farms, as well as many other type of solutions. So, uh, uh, communication between all of these different stakeholders and, and data flows between all these different stakeholders to ensure that the requirements and, uh, are met to be able to call this really sustainable finance is essential. Uh, uh, probably, you know, uh, we shouldn't uh, have a proper introduction uh, 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 on this topic if we didn't talk a bit about green bonds. Um, uh, obviously, this is a uh, one of the uh, uh, most successful financial products. It's now very well uh, uh, accepted uh, across many jurisdictions for many type of projects and multiple standards have been developed in the past few years. You know, the, for example, ICMA, the International Capital Market Association created a, uh, green bonds principles already many years ago. Then it came CBI, the Climate Bonds Initiative, and last year, in fact, uh, 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 that was actually how I got involved in ISO, the parts one, uh, two, and four of the ISO green bond standard was released. But this is not enough, actually. The EU currently is working as well in its, its green bond standards. I want uh, 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 this, this uh, type of uh, uh, financial instruments, you know, uh, they can be used to fund energy, waste management, a circular economy, among many others type of projects. This is where we need to kind of refer to the concept of a taxonomy that helps to define what can be considered green and not. Uh, the best example is the EU taxonomy, uh, which as we all know, uh, came into full implementation just this month of January, 2022. And 
And it is something that is still uh, moving and evolving. Uh, with and will be fully fully implemented with all these aspects, you know, within the next two to four years. Uh, Green bond, uh, just to provide more uh, background into what it is and what it actually differs from a traditional bond, has two extra steps when compared to a traditional bond. Uh, these are uh, number one use of proceeds, which is how the money in the bonds was spent, and probably most important is impact assessment, which is what is the actual outcome uh, of the actual uh, 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 bond. And this, for example, can be in, in the way of uh, emissions, actual emissions reduced, or water saved, or waste uh, reduced, among many other potential KPIs. So mitigation finance and emerging technologies. Here is where uh, we come and, and, and connect this uh, with uh, uh, the world of sustainable finance and ESG with technology. I think first point to make is the fact that blockchain is a technology that it, it shouldn't stand alone in, in, in isolation or, or is one, not one solution uh, that works uh, alone. It actually has the best potential when actually it's combined with other technologies. Specifically, for example, data technologies are, are essential. And uh, we have here, you know, on the right now, the list of big data and general things. So this is, for example, how data could be collected from projects, like, for example, uh, agricultural projects, uh, transport projects, energy efficiency projects. All that data that's coming from uh, sensors and devices, and which is very big, can come and made it into the cloud. Okay. Then all of that data can be analyzed and extract the really valuable insights, really clean. And that type of more valuable data is what actually made it up into a blockchain. And, and here I have to actually refer to one important uh, uh, term that we have in computer science. It's called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, if you end up introducing just garbage into a blockchain, what you can extract out is just garbage again. So uh, this is actually a big part of the, uh, the, the, the time I spend as a technology expert combining all this uh, and, and actually making it useful uh, applications that deliver actual value in the real world. And it's all to do with act, actually that part of the cleaning the data, processing data, identifying what actual data is what is required to meet the stakeholder requirements. Uh, this is also explains very well why I'm so involved with the standardization, because at the moment, this is a big part of the problem. Different projects in different jurisdictions uh, involve with different stakeholders, then they are all totally different. And you then have no way of comparing apple oranges. We, we need, and one big part of, of what we need to help really scale the right type of sustainable finance is comparability. We need to be able to compare different uh, sustainable finance projects and see which one is better. And if the data is totally different or is not normalized, this becomes extremely difficult. Uh, finally, I would like to just you know mention a bit the the, the role of edge computing uh, and other aspects uh, uh, as technology keeps spreading, keeps becoming more widely available. Um, we will find that uh, uh, more of these uh, 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 technologies can be applied in a more decentralized or edge computing way. So we don't need to actually now send all this data into one centralized place in the developed world, for example, in London, financial center like London or uh, uh, New York. Uh, uh, plenty of this data that is collected in projects can be actually stored and use and leverage locally uh, where it's actually uh, been uh, implemented. As I mentioned before, these also bring many other potential benefits, for example, around privacy and, and users protections. Uh, it can also help increase, you know, resilience, reliability, uh, you know, as not everything is stored in one place where if it fails, obviously uh, the entire project can be jeopardized. 
And all of these technologies, finally, it's good to mention that they can be interconnected. You know, uh, as I mentioned again before, uh, 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 blockchain is actually works best when connected and when leveraged with other technologies. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, I'll try to keep it short and, and yeah, uh, welcome questions at the end. Thanks a lot, uh, Pedro. Um, we will now continue with, um, with Bill, uh, the co-founder and head of origination of all infra, um, to provide a presentation, uh, Bill, the floor is yours. Right, thanks uh, for the intro. So maybe just a bit more color on my background before getting into environmental finance uh, in the late 90s, uh, quite active in oceanography. And so what's interesting is it's coming full circle, you know, doing research out in the oceans, looking at the implications of um, biological activity and how that impacts CO2 balance between the oceans and atmosphere. And we're starting to see even some interesting carbon sink uh, projects at scale in, in the ocean. So it's fun to see that uh, part of my career coming back. But yes, as in the past 25 years, 21 or so years, very focused on environmental finance. So let me um, share a screen here. Okay. Um, so all infra, uh, just want to emphasize up front, we're, we're going to talk a bit about using blockchain in environmental finance, but uh, I want to emphasize that you know, we're not coming at this from the perspective of being blockchain enthusiasts looking to, you know, or, or tech enthusiasts jamming tech into uh, uh, any use case we can find. We're very much long-term environmental markets finance uh, folks looking at very narrow but high impact ways to use technology to unlock uh, uh, optionality, de-risk assets, uh, and, and really accelerate climate finance. Um, so, just to point out, the upside down A in our name is the mathematical symbol, the universal quantifier. It symbolizes the concept of for all. And that, that encapsulates a little bit of what we're after. We're looking at low carbon infrastructure as a high quality asset class that's hard to get access to. And as a long-term goal, unlocking that asset class as you know, investable for at least a wider audience of investors. The way we go about that is through our all infra climate platform, uh, that's very much our data collection as direct from source as possible. So in relation to low carbon infrastructure um, and even natural capital assets like grasslands and forestry, getting data as direct from source as possible to create better product, more efficient product. And all in for digital is the digital securities platform. So that's taking the financial component, let's say the equity debt or hybrid exposure to an asset and packaging that into a tradable digital instrument so maybe to paint a little bit of a, you know, just what sort of assets are we after? So we're working on a number of projects in the renewables plus natural capital space. So um, the, the interesting goal there is to take what is a bread and butter business for renewable developers where, you know, it's a very capital intensive business, stable revenues, good impact, uh, various environmental products like carbon credits and renewable certificates. And then natural capital, so grassland rehabilitation, agriculture um, and soil re rehabilitation, forestry, um, with that, those are really important um, aspects of carbon reduction, carbon sink uh, market, but very hard to manage. And renewable developers day in, day out, or, and I describe it here as the ground game. The ground game of renewable developers is um, is really getting permits, getting uh, uh, land uh, security, uh, uh, getting stakeholder um, stakeholders on board, aligning interest, and those are the sort of things that are often missing in in otherwise good quality natural capital projects. So we're working with you know best in market developers in on the renewable space and bringing into that um, into that mix you know what what would otherwise be a cost and a compliance topic for renewable developers and making that a real value driver credits from from better land usage. So the tech side, you know, for us, where that comes in is one, democratizing the investment opportunity in certain cases. So creating tradable um, and listable tokens that represent both the financial exposure to the assets, so the distributions of equity or, uh, or debt repayment, debt service, and the distribution of environmental financial products. 
And on that environmental financial product side, that can be pro rata um, with the holding of the investor or asymmetric. So dis differential distribution to various holders, depending on what they're in the, um, you know, in, in, in the uh, asset for. And then digital verification. So by digitizing as much of that data collection side as possible, it's not only uh, valuable in terms of creating better product, but it's also uh, integrates well into things like carbon accounting, green ratings, uh, and other sorts of reporting. So by putting that data direct from uh, the asset provenance onto digital rails, essentially, you can multipurpose that for um, you know for for various use cases, not double counting. In fact, avoiding double counting along the way. Okay. Oops. Okay. So. Just going to flag this uh, project genesis, and this is an example of, of a sort of financing that you know that this would apply to. So, project genesis is a green bond prototype led by Bank of International Settlements and Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and that's a project that we've been in, involved with for some time. The goal of that is to create a prototype technology for tokenizing finance, uh, in this case, a green bond, and using uh, digital verification of asset performance. That essentially what was mentioned before as both the use of proceeds and the ongoing reporting and digitizing that. So just graphically, as an example, a solar asset financed or portfolio solar financed by, by green bond, that data coming from, in this case, a smart meter, but in other cases, uh, flow meters, building management systems, that data is collected and reported every five minutes and recorded through our electric reader onto chain. Um, that's, that granular data is important for various use cases, so you can create permissioned access through a node to your ratings agency, your accounting firms, regulators. Um, you can feed that data via API into then the tokenization platform. So the instrument holders on the token side are getting both um, verifiable blockchain-based data, but also um, through an API into a dashboard that simplifies that data for the user. The Just to mention this off-device uh, workflow was um, really to acknowledge that there's you know, there's plenty of data that relates to that broader climate finance or environmental finance, sustainability finance that's not going to be sitting on a device. So think of things like biodiversity reports, uh, maintenance reports, social reports, uh, maybe someday, but for now, uh, what you need are credentialed parties that that do those sorts of surveys. But it's often important to have that same information across a similar vintage, let's say for a particular quarter or year, um, associated with a product and that data is available. So what we've done is we've created a workflow where that gets pinned to essentially that same vintage of data used in a particular product. Um, that's Project Genesis, uh, Bank of International Settlements and Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Um, now just to kind of parachute through some of the functionality, this can be a bit dry, but you know, in a sense it's intentional um, by digitizing and and kind of getting excited about the art of the possible in, um, you know, in environmental finance, it's important to remember that some of the mundane things, uh, and in fact, all the mundane things need to be attended to. So things like investor onboarding, account creation, KYC, AML, um, collection of tax, CRS and FACA information, um, subscription to documents, investor management, compliance management of the instruments themselves, digital security issuance, uh, token management, uh, asset reporting and disclosures. And just to run through a few sort of screenshots, so uh, account creation, KYC, AML, digital sec security subscription, um, lifecycle token management, so issuance, redemptions, cash distributions, the application of various compliance policies. This is quite interesting in, in that for any particular issuance of instruments for a particular asset, compliance settings can be made um, so that those that particular batch of tokenized instruments are have native compliance. So they're you know you can and you can adjust settings as needed based on regulations. Um, again, CRS and FACA online uh, tax information collection, boring but needs to be done. The once you know an investor has exposure to a, an asset or multiple assets, 
um, having the ability to concentrate or diversify exposure by region, sector, or by, by impact objective is then becomes possible and, and fairly efficient in that the instruments are tradable um, over time. And there are a number of exchanges looking to list green digital securities, some that already have um, creating various sort of uh, access points for liquidity. Monitoring of both the financial and impact. Once that information is in a digital environment, it makes it very easy and efficient to have confidence around the performance of those assets, both financially and uh, environmentally. So, this, this is just to depict that at, you know, at various levels, the um, information via Blockchain Explorer can be inspected so that whilst you're looking at information generally through a dashboard that summarizes important information in a useful way, occasionally that information may need to be inspected uh, over particular vintages, um, audited, and so the Blockchain Explorer allows very easy access at various contract levels across that asset for inspection. Um, and then finally, just to note that this uh, the same information that's being uh, that you can query through APIs, you can retrieve block hashes, timestamps, uh, various meter readings, um, and so forth. That information is fed by API to then give you the color of a dashboard. So I think for the moment, that's that's what I wanted to go through. Um, I know we'll have a Q&A session later, and I guess um, just just again to flag, whilst you know we do we do quite uh, get excited about some of the ways in which we're using blockchain and other tech in this space, the way we look at the, the this opportunity set is really to unlock um, value, create optionality, reduce frisk friction, reduce costs in order to accelerate environmental finance and thereby accelerate environmental impact. So uh, quite excited about where things are headed in, in the market that I know and love. So uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Bill, for the, for the great presentation. Um, again, to all the participants joining, please feel free to drop already your questions through the Q&A function. Uh, you just have to click on the three dots at the bottom right uh, and they're on Q&A and there you can submit your questions. We're going to pick them up at the end. So now I uh, want to hand over the floor to Alex Casas, the head of blockchain at Climate Trade. Alex, the floor is yours. Uh, I know that we have a little bit of a different uh, setup now. Um, Alex will provide a little product demo, uh, another format that we haven't had in our uh, webinar series yet. Really excited to to see what uh, what Climate Trade is about. Over to you, Alex. Thanks a lot, Valentin. Happy New Year, everyone, and thanks for the invitation. A pleasure to be sharing this this workshop in this series to today. Uh, I would like first to do a little uh, introduction to what we are doing, where we're we coming from, and where we're we heading to. Uh, before, like sewing, like as we say in Spain, like movement demonstrates by walking. So let's walk, walk a bit in the process of buying a tokenized carbon credits purchase with all the transparency that blockchain can, can provide. First, I would like to point out that Climate Trade was the, the first project in tokenizing carbon credits back in 2018. As such, we were mentioned in, a UNN, in the UN Social Survey in 2018 uh, to be like an enabler for a peer-to-peer -peer global market uh, for carbon and connecting to IoT. Uh, now users of carbon uh, offsetting were like running away from cryptocurrencies so we did a like a pivot not to use like the tokenization feature of, of blockchain but to provide like a, a mirror to what's happening in the off-chain world with the flows of capital and carbon credits to trace it on the on the blockchain so <clears throat> in the market trade in the market play Days that these are products, we are just connecting supply and, and demand uh, without any further uh, intermediaries. So it's just like an Amazon. There are project developers that upload their already certified and registered uh, projects, and we connect them uh, with, uh, with the buyers that are looking for particular projects to do their, their offsetting. So, for example, now uh, most of the biggest publicly listed companies in Spain are working uh, with us. As some year we are expanded Japan, United States, and and Germany. And so far, uh, it's impressive to say that we have collaborated to offset more than one and a half million 
uh, tons. And when we start doing this pivot, uh, like running away from the from the token representing the, the carbon credit, we realize like we all have uh, realized some of the pain points of carbon markets that are hopefully like most clear is that the transit that was very opaque and, and prone to fraud, but also it had a lot of friction. It has a, it was a process that was not uh, digitized at all. Sometimes offsetting your your carbon credits supposed or implied like doing telephone calls, writing mails, and, and chasing your your certificate. So what we did was not only to put the traceability and trans transparency blockchain, but also to uh, like to streamline uh, this process to make easier for sustainability managers or just individuals who are concerned about their, their footprint uh, to reduce their cognitive effort uh, to do a, a carbon a carbon purchase. So related to the blockchain space, we are like we have uh, very been very lucky to, to have been experimenting with lots of platforms. We started with Ethereum uh, in 20 in 2018, but soon we realized that it was not current. We couldn't be like offsetting uh, <clears throat> offsetting footprint by creating more footprint. So we migrated to a Stellar, and it well it went uh, great. But soon we realized that the platform was not like providing all the functionality for all the the plans and the roadmap that, that we have uh, ahead. So. Finally, we moved on to Algorand, the greenest blockchain, which is like very aligned to us in terms of uh, like sustainability and, and performance to 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 take and to reality our our vision about using blockchain for for carbon markets. So, uh, this said, uh, I will stop talking, and I think it's uh, yeah, the best to do is like to show you how a, a real process looks like and and to do that trace and to how is the capital going and how are the carbon credits moving. So I'm going to share my screen. Just allow me a second, please. Okay, so here is our homepage for the marketplace. Here we can see all the projects that we have. And if I'm a, like, yeah, a sustainability manager, let's suppose I want to see a carbon offsetting project. I can select the standards in this case, let's make it the types. Let's make it simpler. Let's see, I want to have Colombia. We have it here from the previous test. And I want projects that contribute to objective eight or 12, 13. Okay, this is okay. So let's see where I see here. Okay, so I see here a couple of projects. I'm going to click in this one. For Colombia, here we can see all the description of the project. And first thing we can see here are the latest sales or latest movements of this project, the details, the ID, the official project website. And here we start to see different things. Every project developer that are there is putting uh, their offer into our marketplace has a, a blockchain address in which they get credited. They get their tokens that they have registered in the official registries. And here I can see all the trace of the transactions made in this in this project. Another thing I can see here that this doesn't have to do about blockchain, but it's all the validation documents. The validation and verification uh, documentation, the first validator, verifier, and so on. So let's suppose I have made my decision for this project and I'm going to buy one ton from this project. Let's suppose I'm offsetting the carbon of my company's trips and I'm going to issue the certificate for me and in English. So I continue to check out. I can pay, I will pay with my climate trade balance that I already have. And Let's see what starts to happen on the Algorand blockchain. So now the purchase is being recorded and all the, the processes are being fulfilled. This takes a little bit of time. Hopefully with Algorand it's really, really fast, but it still takes a little bit of time. It's about to, to finish. Yes. Okay, perfect. Two seconds more. Okay, so I have a certificate that is going to be loaded right now. 
it's here. This is my transaction. I can see here the data of my purchase. So I have this certificate that is preliminary until I get the official one from the registry. And let's see what there is special here. I have a transaction group that will show what has happened behind the curtains. Okay, so we can see that here I have my balance in dollars. So this first transaction is converting my dollars to euros and being sent to my account. So out of this amount, this quantity, 3.5 euros, are going to the developer of the project. 0.63 are going to us for the fees and taxes, and this is the fee that is paid by, by the developer. So we can see that out of the 4.13 euros I paid, how much is going to the directly to the developer, how much is going in fees and, and taxes, and how much is paid by the by the developer. And at the end here, we can see how from the account of the project, one ton is being sent to this account. Account there is like a dumping account. It's an account where the tokens get burned so they can be used again. And in the explorer, we can see the remaining balance, how many credits have been offset it and burned uh, by this developer in this batch, and how many are are remaining. So now I have I have made my purchase, I have my certificate, I can see all the traceability, all the process of the of the carbon credits and the and the money. And I can rest here that there is no unfair policies, for example, like buying credits at very low prices and selling them uh, very expensive and so on, like I think we are all uh, used uh, used to. And I think this is like a first step. Uh, blockchain is a very new technology. So what we learned with the, with the time is that uh, uh, the approach is step by step on tackling the problems by uh, one by one, not uh, not all at not all at once. And the first problem we want to contribute solving was this transparency about who gets what. And I don't know; it's there is like still a little bit of a uh, little bit of time, but not not uh, a lot. So I'm happy to to answer your questions during the during the Q&A and just to finalize, yeah, by the way, I will receive in the next couple of days, the official compensation certificate from the, the registry and the official uh, invoice for my, for my purchase. And I can have here all my history of transactions I have made with the amounts and the, the transactions of movements that we have already, that we have already uh, seen. Thank you very much. I will be happy to, to answer all your questions in the, in the Q and A. Handing over to you back, Valentin. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks a lot for the, for the great product demo. Um, this was very insightful. Um, so now we are at the end of the three, uh, presentations of today with the two guest speakers and Pedro. Um, and we are heading over to the Q&A session. There, I would like to give the floor to Alistair Mark, who is the Director General of the BCI, who is leading the Q&A session. I've already put some inspiration, uh, inspirational questions in the chat. Um, so far, I haven't seen any other questions. So please, to all the attendees, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A uh, function. And uh, the, the panelists are available here to answer. Over to, to you, Alistair. Thank you, Valentin. Good afternoon or good morning, good evening, uh, everyone, depending on where you are now. So, okay, let me um, uh, start the, the Q&A sessions uh, with our uh, very lovely panelists who have um, uh, demonstra uh, demonstrated uh, uh, either the um, viewpoints or products uh, throughout um, the, the presentations. That's very good. So uh, my first question uh, that comes out of um, uh, Valentin's um, inspirations uh, is that, um, so uh, for uh, Pedro's, uh, Bill's and uh, Alex's um, uh, presentation, uh, what is really in common uh, is uh, among them is that um, every, all of them are dealt with um, green finance. So uh, the green bond, of course, is an investment instrument that underpins uh, all the um, uh, green infrastructures, uh, which uh, are interconnected or actually uh, covers um, the, the green bonds, 
uh, sorry, uh, the green, inf um, the low carbon adaptation or mitigation, renewable energy infrastructure, or carbon finance, um, and, and, and the other hand. So um, uh, one of the common um, uh, uh, conditions uh, that um, uh, we have to meet is that, go back to square one, how are we going to convince the users to switch to a blockchain uh, platform. This is uh, quite compatible with uh, Valentin's um, uh, uh, initial question on how do you make different investment opportunities, comparative and transparent. So I think this is um, the first challenge. The challenge is never on technologies, but on the people. <laughs> so let's deal with the people first. Okay, which, uh, which colleague would like to, which panelist would like to start first? <laughs> Maybe Pedro? Well, I, I guess I can start very quickly. I mean, I, I have quite a lot of experience as a consultant in digital transformation programs. In fact, I, I could recall my time at HSBC almost three years as part of one of the largest uh, digital transformation programs. And unfortunately, it's not easy. I, I think in terms of actual in, uh, investors buying these products, I, I think that probably could actually be fast because uh, I think as the demo of Alex and Bill demonstrate, you can get data almost pretty much real time. You can see transparency. Everything is, looks amazing, in fact. Uh, but the problem is, who are the issuers of this? You know, because all of this is, you know, needs to. There are many stakeholders involved in all of this, and that's where the problem. We need to get, for example, into the banks, the traditional big banks that we all know their names. Uh, you know, that issue bonds as well as other players. We need to get the regulators because uh, these are regulated financial products. And at the moment, we are obviously at the fringe of the regulation, like, for example, as, uh, you know, what Bill was explaining, you know, with asset tokenization, which is still not regulated in most places. Uh, obviously, Singapore is probably ahead of others and trying to move faster with uh, legalizing the, uh, or regulating this type of new financial products. But, but yeah, I think it's mainly some specific stakeholders in all the supply chain are the kind of blockers and obviously the regulator. I think this is the main blockers, but I don't know. I love to hear Bill and Alex as well. Use. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Pedro. Yeah, so actually, I'm quite pleased to hear uh, 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 Bill's um, uh, presentation uh, uh, about uh, the the, uh, the Greenborn application uh, being piloted by BIS and Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Yeah, I'm originally from Hong Kong, um, though if I cannot give a preferential treatment <laughs> about that, <laughs> the application. But anyway, um, uh, speaking of um, uh, Pedro's question, who are the issuers? So, uh, uh, Bill, in your case, who are the issuers uh, of those um, Greenborns? Uh, in your applications yeah sure that that would be the you know the traditional so so under the uh, the bis project genesis project those will be um either government issue issuers or private issuers for our business you know we work quite closely with developers of low carbon infrastructure so quite a number of renewable energy developers um uh, forestry management companies uh groups that have you know, if you look at the history of clean development mechanism, for example, lots of asset types that have the potential to, you know, move the average um, emissions in a particular industry down, but you need to be able to gather that data, verify whether the, those assets are actually, you know, moving the needle. And so, so that's, you know, those are the sort of issuers, particularly for us, renewables and, and, and natural capital developers, I guess the, um, you know, to kind of maybe remark on why or how hard is it to get people to digitize and maybe why do they do it? Um, I look back at, you know, how, how hard it was over time. We were doing verification for 20, 30 plus projects a year. And you really, you know, you had liquidated damages or penalties on the other side of your contracts in a volatile market, really painful stuff. And, and what's really, what's quite valuable to, to me in terms of having constant data feed. So for, for a green bond, you might have that use of proceeds test and then periodic manual checks. Having that digital not only allows an efficient, in a sense, audit, um, but but that ongoing data feed really informs the holder as to what the, what the likely production of renewable certificates, carbon credits is going to be. So then you can start to manage your book accordingly, not just wait for the end of the year answer after a long lengthy verification, you've got constant insight. So those are the sort of issuers we deal with. 
and I guess the why digitize is on an ongoing basis, you've got constant insight to, you know, in a sense, dynamically hedge your position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bill. Uh, in terms of uh, tokenizing uh, carbon credits, uh, of course, um, the issuer's role is uh, even more important in order to command um, the uh, the trust uh, of the stakeholders uh, in the global carbon market, particularly after the COP26. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, we've I've seen the, the um, in, uh, new international consensus um, to uh, to certain new approaches uh, for uh, operationalizing the ITMO, the International Transfer Mitigation Outcomes in Articles um, 6.2, 6.4, and 6.8, etc. So um, in climate trade, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, Alex, uh, how would you see um, um, uh, the uh, receptiveness of um, uh, issuers of uh, carbon credits uh, in migrating uh, their uh, daily work onto the blockchain-based platform? Great question. Thanks, Alex. And I would like to link it to a previous comment you made about how uh, we solve the challenge people on knowledge. And it's easy. Let's forget about the blockchain technology. It's not an end itself. It's a tool. Let's make product that makes people lives easier and, and, and greater and that they find an utility. And it's the same for developers. And they can use a platform that gives them access to a greater liquidity because people have more trust. That's a good reason. And I link it too to the question that one of the people in the audience was doing about the, the advantages of working blockchain versus another uh, the technologies at the end of the day today we are not talking uh, in any platform we are not seeing that this is using tcp ip no it just works it just makes your lives better so people uh, is using it and, and this challenge is not like uh, in 2018 when we started the the, the tooling and the the, the the wallets for example for people were very hard to use and to have the custody it was very very like uh, difficult have proper uh, management of keys today that's not a problem anymore or, or a, such or at least not such uh, a big uh, a big problem so i think we are in the in the right direction every uh, stakeholder in the in the carbon markets are finding the advantages of using this kind of, of platforms and i'm particularly excited about the, the future to to come and be like buying a tool and a good solution for tackling uh, the emergency that we are living because we are at the end of the day today we are talking about an emergency so it's clear that we also should put all our efforts not into educating people about blockchain because that's important but educating people about how to use technology to warranty that we can have uh, an error that is livable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Alex. I, and I, actually, I, I quite like um, uh, your response around um, uh, uh, emergency and educating uh, people um, on uh, blockchain's applicability. So um, that um, uh, uh, prompts me to the next uh, challenge uh, for um, a applying blockchain uh, in uh, all these um, uh, green finance areas. So, so Alex, uh, uh, in, uh, in the case of um, climate trade, um, how did you um, educate or uh, build up the capacity of those uh, issuers or any users in order for to familiarize themselves uh, with uh, the blockchain platforms, or what kind of key uh, uh, or memorable questions you've got from the stakeholders so far? Well, I don't, uh, not sure, like, because I'm not the one in, in contact with developers, there is another, uh, another team, so I'm afraid I, I, I don't have, like, the, the concrete uh, touch and, and contact uh, with, uh, with developers to see what are their, their pain points, but I guess it's not very different, like the lack of tangibility and where is this, where, where, where are my credits when I tokenize them? And these mm -hmm. kind of, of questions are the ones that we have been uh, preparing and developing uh, like educational materials for people to, to understand in the same way that uh, with the mail we had to, to say well, here you put uh, an address and you put a text and hit send. But the problem here, people didn't worry about how the SMNTP protocol work it but here we are talking about value so people want to know more and it's normal mm. it's like a human behavior i mean it's the way we is the way our mind uh, it's the way our mind uh, works but still uh, it's not 
an easy concept in the same way that understanding SMTP was not an easy task for the most of the people. It's the same for, for, for this technology. So I think that in the same way that in e-commerce people was like gaining confidence in transacting in that way, we are living this in this very precise moment. So I think it's just like to, to honestly answer the questions, to humbly explain how in, in, in simple terms, what, what we are doing and what are the, the advantages and that's for my side and in my opinion, like 70% of the, of the work for solving this challenge. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a very uh, a, a good uh, response to uh, already to uh, Linus questions on that um, chat uh, uh, channel. Now, can you use the blockchain for common credit help course comparison of the units of common credit across different issues in various jurisdictions? Yeah, I think as you said, this is this lies in the seventy percent work that you're trying to do. Oh okay, uh, yeah, but for um, but let let us um turn to uh for the last few minutes, let's turn to um all infra uh, uh bill. Uh, in the case of um the blockchain based uh green bond uh prototypes, um uh, uh in a sim in a sim uh um to derive from the question uh, from our audience uh here, um is there any way you helped um the the uh, the audience uh uh uh, compare the cost of um, uh, green bonds uh, issuance uh, and monitoring uh, with uh, your application. Or is that something that you would look into in the future? Uh, and and I'll, let me just preface that I don't know if it's my audio or, or connection, but it's getting very choppy at times. It may be my side, so I'll try to answer and hopefully catch most of it. Um, so. I think the way that um, the way that so far thus far we've been looking at it from a cost perspective in terms of the data uh, gathering reporting is in, is twofold. One, you know, verification. We look at the data when you look at our energy production uh, or other emission reduction related data. Um, typically, verification. Uh, takes a matter of months, you know, two, three, sometimes six months for data gathering, reporting, uh, compilation, and 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 sort of going through gaps analysis. Um, the having that data in essentially real time, every five minutes updated on chain saves a lot of time. So from a from perspective, it's it's very low to get connected. Um, you don't have manual site visits, and so it's roughly. I don't know about 30% of the cost of a manual verification, but more valuably in the view is the optionality then of having that data um, up, up to date, visible, and ready to be in a sense um, driven into a multitude of use cases. The optionality of having it current at hand and usable, um, you know, so you can again reduce the cost for your your green ratings. You can reduce the cost for your carbon accounting so that tokenized instrument and the reporting sits right on your carbon accounting balance sheet if you're an asset manager um, again same data um, typically and historically that's two or three or four different types of audit processes um, here you're using much the same data for let's say 50 percent of that audit so the optionality of of being able to use that data across various use cases it's saving time, cost, and creating optionality. Yeah, um, yeah. The transferable data sets are quite uh, important in terms of boosting the interoperability between uh, application one, two, three, four, and five, and so on. Yeah, so uh, in the interest of time, um, so uh, I think we need to uh, uh, wrap up here. And then um, I believe that this is a very, um, a, a very uh, meaningful uh, discussion. We are uh, short, I'll be short uh, uh, in, on this panel uh, so far. And um, and then uh, uh, we uh, at the Blockchain Climate Institute are quite uh, happy to uh, continue working with um, different uh, uh, innovators um, to, um, uh, to uh, smoothen uh, the um, uh, the frictions uh, from the markets or regulators um, and, and, and make it a, a more comfortable path for everyone. Uh, yeah, can I uh, hand uh, uh, hand a microphone virtually back to Valentin? Thank you, Alistair, for leading the Q and A session, and thank you for the for the great answers from the panelists, um, and also to all the attendees. Uh, I just pasted a link in the chat again for the next um, webinar to which you are obviously 
very much invited to. I'm also sharing my screen now just to share some information. Um, the webinar next week will be on managing carbon emissions through blockchain. It is uh, in parts linked to uh, some of the today's discussions, but we will focus a bit more on uh, international carbon markets, meta registries, um, and Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. We will have um, uh, after a short introduction on managing carbon emissions through blockchain from the BCI side again, two great speakers um, on, uh, on, on structuring and, and enabling uh, international carbon markets, uh, uh, trading and carbon meta registries, um, one from the private sector perspective, one from the public sector perspective. We're looking forward to great discussions there uh, and also to great answers from our, uh, to great uh, questions from, from our panelists and obviously great answers also from our, from our uh, speakers next week. So uh, looking forward to seeing you there again. Thank you for joining um, this time and have a great rest of the day and weekend ahead. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.